Hello and welcome. Uh, we have a very special SGMD today from New York City in partnership with the Clinton Global Initiative. And today we're talking about the science of success, investing in babies' minds. Uh, let me just tell you, there's something a little intimidating about doing a panel on intelligence. It's very hard to look good, I think, especially when you meet our guests in just a moment. But before I introduce them, I, you know, I want you all to think of, for about a couple of points. What is intelligence? What is the value of intelligence? And how do we ensure that every child out there can reach their full potential? I'm a neurosurgeon, and I'm fascinated with what I think is the most complex biological system in the world. So let's just take a moment to appreciate it. By the time a human embryo is five weeks old, it is just the size of an apple seed. But the brain has already begun to grow. By eight weeks, the basic structure of the brain and central nervous system are in place. The neural networks are spreading out, and even now the nerve signals are traveling more than 150 miles an hour. At birth, nearly all 100 billion neurons of the human brain are already in place. But the brain only weighs about 25% of what it will later on. It's about to embark on its fastest growing period, quadrupling in size by the time a child finishes preschool. By age six, the brain is 90% of its adult size. During that burst of growth, 700 new neural connections are formed every second. As we gain the capacity to smile around two months, to talk usually around a year, and to dress ourselves around the age of three. In those early years, in fact throughout our lives, the brain changes through experience, learning to speak, taking those first steps, understanding colors and shapes, forming novel thoughts. But as certain neurons are used more frequently, other unused neurons go away. It's a process called pruning. And almost anything can shape us in those baby and toddler years. First words. First ice cream, first TV show, first argument, for better or worse. And here with me now, um, Dr. Rosemary Trulio. She's the Vice President of Education and Research for the Children's Television Workshop. Among other things, that means she's responsible for developing the curriculum that you see on Sesame Street. Also, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris. She's a pediatrician from Oakland, California where she's founded the Center for Youth Wellness, which she runs. She's also an expert advisor to Too Small to Fail. It's an initiative which was launched by Mrs. Clinton and the Clinton Foundation to improve the well-being of kids from birth to age five. And I think you may recognize the woman right here to my left. Hi, Dante. Thank you all very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, there, there's several things I, I, I want to get to today. And as I mentioned, I am really fascinated by this topic. But Secretary Clinton, I want to I, I want to ask you a couple things. First of all, just about what's happening in in the world, if I could. Uh, we know that the the U.S. is currently bombing targets in Syria. We know that that bombing campaign is likely to continue for several days. Uh, the, the question is, do you think this is the right move, and is it the right timing? Well, Sanjay, I think the president gave a very uh, clear explanation and robust defense of the actions that he has ordered uh, with respect to uh, the terrorists uh, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, certainly the support that has been offered by Arab nations as well as others, uh, the first airstrikes included, uh, as you know, uh, uh, planes from uh, Arab nations in the region. Uh, demonstrates that this is a recognized international threat. And clearly the president has said no American soldiers are going to be involved, but we do have unique capabilities that we are using uh, to give time to the Iraqi government, to other governments to put together uh, the kind of uh, force that is going to be necessary to uh, take on, to degrade, and to defeat uh, these uh, groups. And, and, and I ask about the timing mm. as well. I mean, is this too late? Well, look, I think you can uh, always argue back and forth. And certainly, when I was in the administration, we had some you know, very uh, good discussions, debates even, about what to do and how to do it, starting with Syria. Uh, and as we watch the situation in Iraq uh, deteriorate uh, under Maliki, who basically broke the promises that he had made to the United States, as to how he would govern. 
so what we know now is that with the spread of ISIL uh, crossing the border between Syria and Iraq, with the horrific behaviors they've engaged in, uh, the beheadings, the kidnapping, and uh, forced rapes and, and marriages of women, the slaughtering of so many uh, Iraqis, the theft of large amounts of money and oil that is probably the most uh, uh, well uh, bankrolled terrorist group that we've seen, able to you know, buy heavy equipment and organize maybe up to 30,000 troops. So it, it's uh, something that I think the president is right to bring the world attention to and to say, whatever the debates might have been before, this is a threat to the region and beyond. Yeah, and, and so just last point on that. It, you, you had talked previously about arming some of the anti-government Syrian rebels. Uh, do you think that this would be happening right now if that had been done at that time? Well, you know, I write about the debate we had in uh, my book, Hard Choices, and I was on one side of the debate, others were on the other side, uh, and there was not a decision made at that time to arm the uh, initial group of rebels who were largely Syrians who were expressing their frustration uh, and, uh, you know, re resistance to Assad. Uh, but I made very clear, I can't sit here today and tell you that if we had done what I had recommended, we would be in a very different position. I just can't. You can't go and prove a negative. But what I do believe is that uh, the uh, situation now is uh, demanding a response, and we're seeing a very robust response, and I think the uh, actions that the president, along with a, a good group of uh, uh, regional countries and those beyond, uh, demonstrates that this is not just about the United States and our views. This is now uh, seen uh, for what it is, a global threat. You know, with, with so many things going on in the world today, the, the panel that you're on is <laughs> the science of success and investing right. in babies' minds. Right. This is a big topic for you, yes. right? Yes. Uh, I'm curious, why, why this topic? Why, why is this so important to you? Well, it's been important to me for a very long time. When I was in law school, I took a, uh, an extra year to go to the Yale Child Study Center and work with uh, physicians who were among the first to be identifying and trying to treat child abuse at Yale New Haven mm -hmm. Hospital and in the medical school. Because I've always been uh, very moved by uh, the challenges that children face. My own mother faced a lot of very difficult challenges and her her resilience coming out of an abusive uh, and neglectful childhood made such a big impression on me. I didn't have anything like that experience, I had a very stable, wonderful upbringing, but to know what my mother went through and to know that there has to be uh, more attention paid to how we help our youngest children get off to the best start. And when I uh, worked on this uh, throughout the years in Arkansas and uh, when I was first lady and senator, uh, I just was fascinated by the brain research, and we have two people here who are very knowledgeable about that, and what it would mean to give every child the chance he or she deserves. And since I'm going to become a grandmother sometime soon, I hope, <laughs> um, I'm very focused <coughs> on that as well. So this is personal to me, but it's also part of the strategy I see that will help us uh, deal with uh, some of the long-term challenges that our kids from less advantaged backgrounds face as they get into school. Back about 40 years ago, I think the book was called Beyond the Best Interests of the Child. Ah, you've done your homework. Yes. yes. 40 years ago, you were about 10 years old. Yeah, I, think, I was. Back at the yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> A very precocious fifth grader. <laughs> yes, <right. laughs> but, you know, it's interesting because we went back and looked at some of that research. And, and when you talk about educational achievements, right. uh, we've certainly made progress in some areas, but over 40 years, I think most people agree not nearly as much as, mm -hmm. as we would, would, would have wanted as a country. Do, do you point to any particular things and say, here's where we sort of missed the boat? Well, it's interesting because uh, we've given a lot of thought to this at the Clinton Foundation when we formed the uh, partnership with the Next Generation Foundation to create Too Small to Fail, and we put together a great advisory board of people with a lot of uh, experience and expertise. Uh, I, I think a couple of things, and, and in no particular order, um, I think that life was a, not as fast-paced or as stressful in many, many ways 40 years ago, mm -hmm. and certainly even before that. Yes, were there problems? Were, did, did our parents and grandparents face a lot of difficulties? Absolutely. 
but income has stagnated. People's economic uh, futures don't seem as predictable and stable as they did perhaps to a prior generation. Uh, and that kind of stress and anxiety uh, does affect how you interact with your children and particularly your youngest children. I think also with the increasing ubiquity of television and now with screens of all kinds in our homes, I think too many people uh, drew the wrong conclusion that yes, talking, teaching your children words, singing to them, reading to them, all of that is great, but that people are talking on TV. So if we put them there or if we give them, you know, access to a computer or an iPad or whatever, you know, they're going to get that too. And what we now know from the brain research is that doesn't work that way. It's the human interaction and reinforcement that takes time, that takes a parent taking a deep breath and not being so stressed out, that takes turning off the television set and putting away the other equipment in order to focus just on that child. And as you point out in your video, to help the hardware of the brain that we're all born with really develop those 700 neural connections right, every second, second yes. uh, that is fed by the personal interactions. The family is a child's first school, the parents and other uh, people in the home are a child's first teacher. And so what we're trying to do is just to help support families to do what only they can do in those very first uh, months uh, and years of life. You, you raise some interesting points, and as you point out, we have the perfect people to address them. Let, let, let me start off with one particular question, Dr. Harris. How much of this do you think is about money? If, if we just as a country put more money into early childhood development, could we have solved some of these some of these issues that we're talking about? I think that's a great question. I think that um, one of the things that's important is recognizing that a lot of our understanding comes out of this emerging science, and some of that has been made possible by the technology that has been enabled really in the last 20 years. And certainly, we do need much, much more significant investments in not only early childhood, but also the science of understanding mm -hmm. what are the things that um, significantly affect the health and development of children from the earliest days. <coughs> but um, when we look at the issue, I, I, a friend of mine, uh, Dave Reagan, uh, who uh, heads the, the SEIU, said to me, I was telling him about the health issues that come from children's early exposure to adversity. And what he said was, when you have the science, then it's not just a, a health problem, it's also a political problem. I don't think that it's just about the money. I think it's also about prioritizing things like screening, prioritizing uh, lifting up best practices, and uh, even just public education, making sure that folks are aware of what's going on. You talk a lot about adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, yes. as I read in your paper. Yes. Um, how, I mean, look, there are a lot of kids out there who have tremendously tough lives, and, and they face a lot of adversity. How do you stratify who is going to be able to rise through that and maybe even be better because of it and those who are just going to be really harmed by it? Yeah, so the term adverse childhood experiences comes from the seminal study that was done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. And when they looked at 17 and a half thousand adults, what they found was that folks who had um, uh, greater exposure to these adverse childhood experiences, including abuse and neglect or household dysfunction like uh, parental mental illness or parental incarceration or domestic violence, uh, those folks had s dramatically increased risk of chronic disease. So someone with four or more of these had uh, double the risk of ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in, in the United States, two and a half times the risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And when we look at individual susceptibility to that, what the science shows us is that it's a combination between nature and nurture. Mm -hmm. It has to do with our biology, but it also has to do with the environment. And, and frankly, we know that early detection makes a big difference. And particularly when we're thinking about young children, we know that children's exposure to adversity, the earlier we intervene, the better the outcome. Things like divorce? I mean, single parents? Yep. Uh, 
again, again the same, same sort of question, but there are, there are people who thrive and do fine and people who are just really affected by that. Yeah, that's true. One of the things that uh, we know about that is that, listen, adversity happens in life to everyone. That's part of life. 90% of Americans will experience some major trauma in their life. One of the things that the science shows us is that when there is a healthy caregiver who is able to serve as a buffer, that prevents that adversity from becoming toxic to the child's neurologic and physiologic development. So, you know, everyone has, has seen examples of divorce where folks are able to work out their stuff, you can co-parent, you know, you can, you can do the, the handoff in the playground. And then there are folks who, you know, it's like that, that movie from the 80s, War of the Roses, right? <laughs> where, where there's so much discord and animosity that it literally, and I think that folks are just beginning to understand this now, it literally creates a toxic environment for the children. And those are the situations where even public education, for parents to be able to recognize, actually the way that we talk to each other in front of the kids makes a difference in their brain development and their long-term health. Is, is important, uh, Secretary Clinton, for two parents to be involved? You wrote the book, It Takes a Village. Mm -hmm. I mean, two parents, one parent. Does it have to be a parent to provide some of these buffers that Dr. Uh, Dr. Burke Harris is talking about? Well, I think as the doctor said, um, there are other ways to provide that buffer. You know, sometimes it is a grandparent, sometimes it's an older sibling or an aunt or an uncle. Um, you know, every child, though, needs a buffer, or as I like to say, every child needs a champion, and that champion um, has to, you know, really invest in that child and to a certain extent buffer and protect that child from whatever the other stresses are. Look, ideally, it's the parents. Um, that, that is ideal. But we know that's not the reality, and we have so many single-parent families, so many blended families. We have so many different kinds of families. And what I think now is important is for adults with responsibilities for children to realize the impact that their I don't want to overstate it, but their every action and their every word, or the absence of the right actions and words, will have on the development of that child. And, and you ask a great question, Sanjay. Okay, so you have you know, three kids in the same adverse environment with the same adults. Uh, one child has all the problems that uh, Nadine is talking about. Another child seems to be relatively unscathed. And you know, the one in the middle, as always, is sort of a little bit of this and a little <laughs> bit of that. We do know something about uh, you know, resilience and even genetic uh, predilection for resilience. Um, but we don't know enough, and we certainly don't want to take a chance. We don't want to be playing roulette with different kids' futures, their, their uh, intellectual futures, their physical futures, their emotional futures. So I think it's important to make, maybe make the point that should be self-evident that you know, having children is, in my opinion, the, the most important responsibility any adult will ever undertake. And the more we can through public education, outreach, and support, which Rosemary knows a lot about, how we create supportive environments so that every parent, regardless of who they are, where they came from, uh, can have uh, the best possible interactions with their kids. You know, just very quickly, I, as a child, I didn't know anything about my mother's really uh, terrible upbringing, but as I became, you know, an older teenager, young adult, and I started learning more about what she'd been through, um, I was just amazed. I thought, my gosh, you know, how, how did she turn out to be a loving mother for us? And I asked her one time, I said, you know, with everything that was going on, she had very young parents, uh, you know, 14 and 16, they mm -hmm. divorced, they sent her off to California, she had a miserable time in her grandparents' home, had to leave when she was 13 and all of that. She said at every point, there was some adult that showed her kindness. Mm -hmm. And so this is not just about the family and all the pressure on the family. It's about the adult community. It's about, you know, the teacher she had. She didn't have any money for lunch. She was like in first grade and she would come every day and they used to eat in the classroom and she'd sit there. She had nothing to eat and the teacher noticed it. So all of a sudden the teacher started bringing extra milk and maybe an extra half a sandwich and she would, and not, not to embarrass my mother, but to say, oh, Dorothy, I'm so full. I've got too much food again. Would you like it? And years later, my mother realized that 
in effect that teacher was feeding her right. and and there are examples of that that you never know where that intervention might make such a difference and so we can't ever give up no matter how toxic the environment that a child unfortunately might be subjected to there are lots of ways to intervene but it'd be better to try to do it right from the beginning. Yeah. You know, I think, I think uh, Secretary Clinton, once you're a parent and you hear a story like you're describing about your mother, it, yeah. it, hits, it hits pretty hard. It's, it's tough to imagine kids going through that, but, but it's, it's happening still, obviously, right now. And some of, you know, when I, when I had kids, I, I didn't know what the right things were. My oldest is nine now, I have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. The idea that parents should instinctively or intuitively know, sort of, there's no, there's no rule book, there's no guidebook. Uh, Rosemary, you know, I mean, this is part of what you you do. I think S Sesame Street I is it a, is it a kid show or a parenting show? I think it's it's both, and that's what's that's what's wonderful about Sesame Street because it is written on two levels. And I often say uh, Sesame Street brings the adult into what we call a co-viewing situation. And I urge parents of preschool children to watch the show because you're going to learn a lot about parenting because we are modeling what we're talking about. We're modeling how you can be interacting and how you can scaffold learning. So it's, it's both. You know, another thing that you say is, uh, and I get this a lot, kids say, why this, why that, why everything? And they have a thousand questions and you say that could be a potential minefield. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that what you have to, I think what First of all, parents, when you get the fifth why question, you break down and say, stop asking, it's just because. Uh, but those first why questions are really important because children are born curious. They have the sense of awe and wonder. They're learning about the environment and they're learning by watching us. So if we could model that sense of curiosity and uh, pose questions as well as answering questions, I think that's great modeling. But we need to answer the questions. Now what happens is that parents get intimidated by some of these questions because they don't know the answer. So what I'm urging is for parents to say, I don't know. And it's okay to say, I don't know. But let's find out together. And that's what in, that creates this disposition for learning. Because we don't want them to lose that inspiration, yeah. awe, and wonder. And that's what often happens when they go to uh, elementary school, formal education, they lose that and, and that's what we have to get back. And, and the importance of planting those seeds early is putting them on that positive trajectory. We're, we're talking about investing in, in babies' minds and you know it's interesting, I was in Denmark recently, Secretary Clinton, and one of the things, this is the happiest country um, on earth, I don't know if you knew that or not, <laughs> Denmark, yes. So we Where's decided, the next plane? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, let's all go. <laughs> the, um, but one of the things they do, and they're very proud of, is they, they invest as a country into early childhood development, specifically around parents, right. providing right. guidance, support, help for parents. You talked about that back in 2008 as well, this idea that we need to provide that support for parents, because sometimes they don't know. Uh, is, is that a provocative thing to do? I mean, is, should the country be doing this? Should we invest in this with, with real money? Well. Obviously, I think we should be investing in it because I don't think there is any more uh, important uh, task than you know, helping our children to be successful. And uh, a lot of other countries have made those investments. Uh, what we're talking about here is at the very beginning to help build those brains uh, that uh, are, are critical to any future learning. But it, it is sad to me. I mean, I, I've been a longtime believer that we should have you know, paid parental leave, paid family leave. I, when I used to, you know, go around the country, both starting in Arkansas and then later, um, I, I would see so many uh, young mothers who were just on a, in a state of, you know, desperation because they might have very little to no time off from work. They would have to get back to work. They would leave their babies, which interrupts the kind of bonding experience that is critical to establishing that relationship. And I certainly am no expert on this, but I, I used to believe that to some, for some of those young mothers, they had to almost emotionally distance themselves from their children because leaving them was so traumatic. And there was nowhere to leave them that was safe and that was suitable to their work hours. We just make it about as hard as possible for so many families, and particularly working mothers, uh, to be able to do what they need to do uh, for their family and perform at work. 
I think that's a big mistake, and I think we are seeing the results of some of that um, lack of investment. And then, of course, I think you know other countries are pretty far ahead of us in early childhood programs and in quality affordable child care for older kids, after school care, the, the whole support system. But boy, it is, you know, talk about traumatic or toxic. It just adds to the stress in a family when, you know, a working parent, usually the mom, is just unable to get everything. There was that article um, a few weeks ago about the barista who had nowhere to live and she didn't know what her schedule was and she was trying to find a place for her son and she would finish at you know 10 o'clock at night on Friday and told she had to open the store at you know six o'clock in the morning and there was no place to leave her son and when the article was published Starbucks changed its policy because it just took that extra push for them to say what are we doing to the young parents that we employ uh, in our stores so thankfully they responded but that's just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. There are still so many um, employment uh, uh, situations where there is no predictability, there's no flexibility, and there is no real support for uh, young parents. You know, doc Dr. Burke Harris, I couldn't help but think when I heard the, the topic of this panel that in some ways it, it's kind of luxurious to be talking about this topic, right? I mean, investing in babies' minds, a science of success, it kind of presupposes a lot of things that, that some people even have the luxury of thinking that way. They're just trying to, to get by, uh, to, to make it all work. You take care of kids, but you also end up taking care of their parents in that regard as well. T tell us about that. How, how does that work for you, and what happens in, in that sort of dynamic? You take care of a, a parent. What's the impact then on the kids? Well, um, I think that it's easy. It's easy for us to see um, taking that two generation approach and caring for both the child and the parent as a luxury. Um, from the standpoint of uh, the research that my center uses, it is a necessity particularly when we're talking about young children, it's really important to remember that supporting the caregiver is part of stabilizing that young child's physiology. I'm just going to say, if you want to reduce the dose of adversity that a child is experiencing, you have to support their caregiver. And I'll give you an example. I had a, a, a young family that I was caring for. There are three kids in this family. Uh, two of them had really, really terrible asthma. And um, they came in to see me for a terrible asthma exacerbation because they were living in substandard housing and uh, there was a fire and their home burned down. So in addition to uh, treating the results of the asthma from, from the fire, it, I discovered that this family was homeless and living in their car. And one of the, the big issues as this family was working on trying to get on their feet was the fact that the mom was depressed. Mm -hmm. When we ultimately ended get, ending up getting that mom in treatment for her depression, the entire family did better. Not only was the asthma management for the young children better, but also we had, uh, they had been struggling in school. That improved the entire family stabilized. And so recognizing we can throw a ton of resources trying to treat each one of those children individually, or we can recognize the family system and treat the root of the problem, which is that we need to help to stabilize this family, and stabilizing that mom did exactly that. I, I love that. You know, it makes perfect sense when you say, when you say it that way, and it just, uh, I, I, I hope a lot of people get to hear that story, because that, that is what we should be doing, I think, as well. I, I, I want to ask about a, a slightly different topic, though. Um, have, have you guys heard of the marshmallow test? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. So the, yeah. basic, the basic premise is uh, these, were, these were preschoolers, and they're put into a room, <laughs> And there's a marshmallow there. Mm -hmm. And they're basically told, look, uh, if you wait 15 minutes, no one else is in the room, you wait 15 minutes and don't eat that marshmallow, we'll give you two marshmallows instead. That was basically, and they wanted to see what the kids would do. And they found that the kids who waited tended to do better overall in life. They were more likely to go to college, they were more likely to have successful careers. And it was this concept of self-control. And self-control is something that Sesame Street tries to do as well, as something they try to teach. Uh, and for those who don't have young children in the house anymore, I want to play a short clip that I thought was <laughs> hilarious uh, to remind people just a little bit about what their work is about. Sure. <laughs> the 
Ah! Wait! Whoa, why, why me? Why, why wait? Because this is the waiting game. And if you wait to eat the cookie until I get back, you get two cookies. <laughs> dum -de dum -de dum Oh, who me kidding? There's no picture of cookie. There's real cookie. <laughs> then what to be waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> it's well done. And parents do learn something there as well. But can can self control be taught? Yes, it is taught. Um, children are born. I, it's wonderful that we're talking about children's brain capacities. They are born ready to learn. And it's the environment, it's, it's these stimulating parent-child interactions that children do learn best. Now, when you're talking about executive function, which are those cognitive skills um, that underlie your, your ability to self-regulate, your ability to control your affect, your ability to have focused attention, and more importantly, your ability to shift your attention. So think about these children who have to go to from from home to school or different contexts, there are different rules and regulations. So you need to be able to know how to behave and, and process information in these various contexts. So what's interesting about executive function skills is that they are learned most rapidly. It's during those preschool years that you see the largest uh, gain in, in their executive function skills. However, they're not innate. They are modeled. And these strategies have to be modeled and taught now, as adults, we all struggle with self-regulation skills <laughs> and executive function skills. And so what's wonderful about what we're trying to do is that we're trying to educate the circle of care, the parents, giving them the strategies so that when the screens are off, parents can then continue in enhancing this type of, of learning. Uh, what, cookie, what you didn't see is Cookie Monster, uh, which is very typical of preschoolers, is if you say to wait, one strategy is pretend now it uses mental effort. Pretend that it's not a cookie, it's a picture of a cookie. <laughs> now that takes a lot of, of, of uh, uh, me, uh, executive function skills. Some children, what they do is they sit on their hands or they'll turn around, because if, if I don't see it, it doesn't <laughs> exist. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to give them, because not what, it's not one strategy fits all. There are different temperaments, there are different uh, strategies that will work, and I think that's what's wonderful about Cookie Monster is that he struggles with self-control. He's very impulsive, especially when you have a cookie in, in, in front of him. So what we're modeling is that you may not always get it right, but it does take time and practice. And we're going to give you as much information as we possibly can to help you. Mm. And I think you know every parent wants the best for their child. It's unfortunate that when we become parents, we don't have a baby manual. We don't go through special parenting classes. And we have to find ways to explain to parents how their baby's brains are growing. So that when you ask them to talk, read, and sing, they have an understanding about why they are talking, reading, and singing. And they need, they need to have these behaviors modeled. Um, uh, so I, I'm sorry, Sanjay, may I add something? Please. One of the things that I think is really important to keep in mind as well is that, um, yes, uh, some of these principles of executive function can be taught, but keep in mind that children who are exposed to high doses of adversity um, have a physiologic inhibition of their prefrontal cortex, which is the area that regulates impulse control. And what we found at our center is that for children who have been exposed to four or more adverse childhood experiences, they actually had 32 times the risk of having learning and behavior problems in school. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about giving children the foundation that they need to be able to have strong executive function, not only do we have to work on, on teaching these things and modeling these for, things for kids, but we also have to lay the right foundation to reduce the dose of adversity so that children's basic systems, right? We're using this brain science to say, okay, we also have to give kids the appropriate right start. That's right. And, and you know, Sanjay, one thing that is, is worth um, 
mentioning is that we have done programs in our country that have sent um, nurse, nurses into homes, um, other visitors into homes in those very earliest uh, days, weeks, and months to help a, pre a mother usually, but a family under stress, uh, to know what to do. Because even if you assume uh, that a parent wants the best for his child or that everybody is you know, trying to cope as well as they can, lots of times it just takes some modeling and some support. Uh, and we have a lot of evidence. There was just a, a recent study that came out of Jamaica where they, it was a very rigorous study and they um, had two groups uh, of kids, same kinds of backgrounds, same socioeconomic uh, status. And one group, they sent a home visitor, the other they didn't, and they followed these kids. And 20 years later, the kids who had the home visitor were doing better. Mm -hmm. they, they were making more, more income, they were more stable, all of the attributes that we're talking about that are going to help you know, give a kid a, a better shot as an adult. Yeah, and seeing the, seeing the child in their own home, again, because they come to the doctor's office, you're not seeing all the potential adverse experiences right. they may have. And they have. can do what Nadine did at her center, which is the real problem in this house is, you know, the yeah. father with this issue, the mother with that issue, the other sibling with another issue. And, and you can begin to get a much broader view of what's affecting the child. And there are a lot of interventions that are cheaper than failing in school and ending up in prison or ending up without uh, the ability to make a living and so much else that unfortunately accompanies these kinds of adverse upbringings. And, and you know, we, this, this applies to all children. I mean, we're talking to some degree about at-risk children, but who, who couldn't possibly benefit? Speaking of self-control, by the way, I think you did a good job with Chelsea. <laughs> she's not finding out the sex of the baby. Yeah, that, that takes true. a lot of self-control. That that's true. true. And you know, she never liked marshmallows, so it's <laughs> <laughs> so like that wasn't was, a problem. Was that, was that hard for you not to know? Did you really want to know? No, it's up to her and her husband. I mean, and, and it's been, you know, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful time for her, and, and we're just anxious to meet this new person, whoever it might be. <laughs> <laughs> Did you buy a particular color baby gift? We have not done any of that. No, no. Of that. <laughs> we, uh, we have shown great executive function. <laughs> I think our work here is done. <laughs> um, we don't know if you're going to wind up as president. We don't know. Um, I go from toxic to we, we, really. <laughs> we don't know if you're running, I think. Do, do we? Yeah, no, I we, think that's No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we do know you're going to be a grandmother, as you point that out. That is absolutely the case, yes. <laughs> do, do you think, based on this discussion that we're having, are the things that you think you would do, obviously your role would be different, you'd be a grandmother, not a mother, but you're, do you think you do things differently now with this grandchild versus how you helped raise Chelsea? You know, it's so interesting because um, on, my, on my book tour over the summer, I, I must have shaken, I don't know, 70,000 hands and probably more than half of them mentioned something about being a grandparent. And, Oftentimes it was sort of joking, like, oh, it's so much better than being a parent. <laughs> you know, if I'd known how good it was, I would have skipped the first part. I mean, that, <laughs> that, that, that kind of uh, back and forth. Uh, I, think, I think that you have just a different perspective, in part because of your time in life and, and all of that, to um, enjoy a grandchild. And, and most of us, when we have our children, you know, we're still younger, we're still striving, we're still preoccupied about what's going to happen in our lives and what the future looks like. And I think a lot of people uh, look back and say, well, you know, I, I, I did the best I could, but maybe I could have spent more time, or I wish I had, or I wish I hadn't been so busy, and all the rest of it. And I think being a grandparent, uh, you, you just have that freedom. Yeah. Uh, at least that's what I'm told, and I'm anxious to find <laughs> out whether that's true, being a member of that club. Yeah, that's, that's, that's just great. I, we, we, have a, we have a few people that want to ask questions from the audience as well, so let's try and get to some of those here in the last uh, couple of minutes. I, I want to start with uh, Dr. Ari Brown. She's a pediatrician in Austin, Texas. She led the group which wrote the American Academy of Pediatrics Guidelines on Screen Time, which basically says no screen time at all for kids younger than two. Um, and I would say, uh, Dr. Brown, uh, this is something that I think all parents probably wrestle with, myself included. W where did those guidelines come from? And, and I mean, I don't, I don't want this to come off the wrong way, but what are the children supposed to be doing instead? Because they do spend a lot of time looking at screens right now. Right, you know, the policy came out 15 years ago and it was largely ignored 
by media and industry and parents who said, you know, I just need 30 minutes to cook dinner, and Elmo has never killed a toddler, which, <laughs> by the way, is true, and we love Elmo, so <laughs> just putting that out there. So we looked at the data three years ago and said, you know, here's our new policy based on all this data. Kids under two, they just don't learn. It's not educational. It's entertaining, but not educational. And they can do so much with independent playtime. So that's what we recommend is, you know, it's amazing what can, you can do with some Tupperware and some wooden spoons. I mean, kids will come up with great ideas. The other thing that we worry about with screens is that it reduces the talk time mm. between parent and child by 85% when the screen is on. And so that's what's so concerning because we know talk time is critical to language and social development for kids. And, and, and did you, based on this discussion, did, did you have a question as well for our panel? I, I do. And so, you know, one of the things that we've struggled with at the AAP is we don't have any policy statement in place on interactive media and apps. Mm -hmm. We get lots of questions, but technology is faster than science. And so really my question is, you know, mostly to Dr. Trulio is, you know, what do we do with interactive media? You know, is that an opportunity for kids to learn? Yeah, I, I'm going to answer that in one second because what I do want to say is, um, Background television is detrimental. So um, I, it gets, that's another example of us not truly understanding what's going on in the minds of children. So often I hear uh, parents say, well, the, the television on, but my baby is not paying attention. Mm. Well, your baby is listening to that television. And uh, as they get older, we've looked at their play. And we know that if the TV is on the background, it does disrupt their play patterns as well in addition to what you said, a reduction in uh, language uh, in because of the parent-child, um, the lack of parent-child interaction because everyone's looking at the screen. Um, we agree with the Academy uh, of Pediatrics, but what we're also learning now is that uh, above 18 months, between 20 and 24 months, there are some interesting studies that are, that are coming out that we know that babies can learn through media. And so what we're trying to do on Sesame Work at Work Sesame Workshop is how do we harness the power of technology to provide developmentally appropriate educational experiences for those children who may not have the parent who is always there on the floor and interacting. That is ideal. We know babies do learn best through parent-child interactions. Now you have these other screens, which we have all seen the commercials, where the baby is, is swiping. They can point and swipe on these screens. And so when you give them a book, they don't know what to do with it. So what they do is they keep <laughs> po poking the, the book because why is it not responding? And I think that's going to be affecting some of our executive function skills as <laughs> we uh, uh, grow older as well. So um, what I want to say is that not all screens are the same. Not all content is the same. So what I want to um, make sure that people understand is that just because content is on an interactive medium, does it necessarily make that content or educational experience a better experience because you are interacting with it? You have to look at the content. You have to see the reason why that content was created. What is the intention of having time with that media content? And that's what we give a lot of thought to. The, the content that we create is research driven and uh, it's designed from a curriculum, a whole child curriculum, so that we're teaching not just the academic skills, but those social emotional skills as well as those health skills. Now, I'm gonna encourage parents that they should be a part of that digital experience. And what we have to urge industry to do, as we did 45 years ago, we brought the parent into the television viewing experience, where are the games that bring the parent in to a co-play uh, experience so that the parent or caregiver can build upon those educational uh, moments? Yeah, thanks. It makes, makes great sense. We got, we got time for another audience questioner, uh, Miriam Schooning. She's the Global Head of Programming and Partnerships for the LEGO Foundation. Uh, we're talking about real blocks here and virtual blocks. <laughs> no one knows blocks better, I think, than LEGO. But the foundation, not the company, has actually been conducting some really interesting research on how certain types of play can affect certain skills later on in life. So uh, I'm going to let you ask a question, Miriam, but, but what are you learning in, in that specific regard? Yeah. Um, well, let me maybe start with, with an interesting fact. Um, if you take six uh, Lego bricks, standard bricks, the two by four um, bricks, I bet you wouldn't 
be able to guess how many combinations you are able to make out of them. It's more than 900 million combinations wow. that you can make out of six standard Lego bricks. So this is just to show how certain types of play can foster creativity because you virtually have almost endless combinations and, and possibilities at your hand. So that's, that's one key message that we're trying to convey, the importance of play in, in fostering creativity. Um, there are other kinds of play, of course, that foster, we already talked about, uh, self-control because kids learn to wait and take their turn. Um, communication skills because you, you, you talk to each other. Um, you, yeah. you need to sort of negotiate what are the rules of the game that you're, that you're looking at. Um, you, you are um, yeah, collaborating in, in, a, in a sense and, and, and honing your, your team skills here. And those are interestingly enough, those communication skills, that creativity, uh, the collaboration, those are typically the, the skills that when you talk to CEOs nowadays, they would identify as the, the key skills that are actually lacking in today's or are um, not well developed enough in, in, in today's workforce. Um, so that for us points to this importance of, of different types of play. It doesn't always have to be with the brick, that's, that's what I'm saying and as foundation we're very much also supporting uh, other fantastic ideas that are, that are um, working on uh, reimagining learning uh, and, and, and basically uh, looking at supporting those around the world. Legos, uh, who, 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 would have, who would have thought? 900 million, I'm 900 sorry. 900 million, <laughs> that's a lot of options <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, math right Yeah, I, I, I'm way behind on that one. Uh. <laughs> Did you have a question for our panel? Yes, my question is, is um, uh, we're um, looking at um, building the, the, the skills or the knowledge among parents about the importance of uh, early learning, um, which I think is very critical and would like to thank Secretary Clinton for uh, shining the spotlight on, on this issue. I think in a year I've seen so much more movement than probably in a decade and the science has been there, so that's, that wasn't the question. Um, but there's a little slight concern that parents might misunderstand this and think that it m means you have to um, get their, your children to read a lot earlier, to do your math a lot earlier, to basically sort of schoolify um, the preschool years, which, which would inhibit a lot of those executive function skills building that we that that you discussed before, um, and and really um, take away the focus of, um, yeah, honing in those skills about how do you learn how to learn, um, and therefore make uh, kids develop um, a lifelong love for learning, which I think is very critical and important. Uh, I mean, Could I answer yeah, that? <coughs> I, I I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think that children are not playing enough and I think there's also a misconception among adults thinking that play doesn't play, a play, play on words, uh, an essential role in child development because it is through those play interactions that children are learning and they're learning about a whole child curriculum. They're building, as you said, those literacy skills. They're building the science. We didn't talk about science. I mean, babies are natural scientists. They're, they're up taking it all in. They're figuring out the laws of physics every time they throw that Cheerio off, the, off the, uh, the, the, their little tray uh, and cause and effect, um, <laughs> which you're going to be finding out about. <laughs> um, but what we have to do is that we have to understand that it's not just these structured, it has to be unstructured. But what we know about learning outcomes in play is that the parents play a critical role in guiding. So as they are playing with their Legos or all their other uh, toys, handmade toys as well, it doesn't have to be store-bought, um, is that parents have to have a better understanding of what they're learning in terms of the science and the math so that they can foster it. And I think that's what we're trying to do with Too Small to Fail, mm -hmm. is to give them the language, to give them those ideas during those everyday moments. Right. It is during those routines. It is during bath time. Bath time is a science experiment. Think about all the things that sink and float. Uh, but we have to provide that. We can't expect that they're going to have all this knowledge. They're not all given. When you become a parent, you're not given, unfortunately, a degree in child development. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> You, but you know, Sanjay, I think um, it's important what, what we're trying to do with Too Small to Fail is to make parents feel good about what they can do for their children. Mm -hmm. Because talking to your child doesn't cost anything. 
and you know reading we're working with a lot of groups to provide books or as you say you know reading you know things in the supermarket as you go up and down the aisle or on the bus right. or just everyday life and you know singing I sang to my daughter until she developed a, an ear for bad <laughs> singing and <laughs> told me to stop but you know the, these things are not expensive you don't have to go to the store and and somebody gives you permission or a degree in talking to your baby so part of what we're trying to do is to remove the mystique right. you know what we worry about is that there's this big word gap because parents like us, I mean, maybe we talk too much, but we talk a lot and our kids pick up a lot of words so that by the age of three, kids from families like ours have heard twice as many words. And you know, by four and five, the word gap is estimated at 30 million. 30 million more words have been heard by kids from um, upper income, uh, affluent families than lower income mm -hmm. families. So what we're trying to do is to basically make the case to parents that this child has a brain that you personally can make really work it, working effectively by doing something that just seems so normal. And we're especially focusing on families where English is not the first language because we have a lot of families, particularly Hispanic families, and out of the deepest concern for their children, they don't want to talk Spanish to their kids because they think their kids should learn English, but they're not comfortable speaking English, so they don't talk much at all. And what we're telling them is talk in Spanish. You know, Cindy McCain, who's here with us and is on our advisory board, you know, made that point. I mean, just talk, you know, whatever language it is. Build that brain. You're, you know, set those neurons uh, to uh, uh, moving and connecting. And so part of our message is, this is, this is not a government program. This is not a big you know, intervention, although there are a lot of other things we should be doing. This is what you can do as soon as that baby comes into your life. It's a lot of pressure, but, but very doable as yeah, well. And, and we, we want to help remove the pressure because we know parents want, as Rosemary said, we know parents want their kids to do well. And too many parents think they don't have much of a role in that, right. that, that you know, they, there's a, there's a great new um, book coming out <clears throat> by Robert Putnam at uh, Harvard, and he divides the time that you spend with your kids between diaper time, which is the necessary time, and good night moon time. <laughs> and good night moon time has been decreasing because of the speed at which we live. So it's really simple. We want to increase the good night moon time uh, and empower parents to make up stories. Even illiterate parents we've talked to, you know, they say, well, I, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know how to read very well. I don't want to set a bad example. Tell a story, pointed pictures. There, there's something for every adult to and, do. And you could do that makeup story during diaper time. Yes. I mean, <laughs> we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have to leave it there. Oh, we're just, just for the time. Nadine, have the last, last word. Go ahead, it, the one thing I just want to say is that recognizing that self-care for parents as well, managing your own stress yes. level allows you to be able to get into that good night moon time yeah. and that yes. diaper time. So really... That's an important record. Get a massage before reading it. I like it. I like it. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for it today. I want to thank every member of, a, of our panel and everyone watching as well. You have the power to influence someone else, and your children as well. Let's use that power wisely. It's going to wrap things up for SGMD. Time now, though, to get you back into the CNN newsroom with Deb Farrick. We are back with a very special SGMD here in New York with partnership in the Clinton Global Initiative. We're talking about how to invest in babies' minds, how to make sure every child has a real shot at success. And it's not just an American issue. In fact, the truth is that we don't always do as well as some other countries. And it's a place that I want to start uh, today with regard to early childhood development and preschool in particular. A lot of countries have higher rates of attendance uh, as compared to us. W why do you suppose that is? Well, I think that uh, you know there's two models which uh, uh, exist in the world today. A lot of the advanced economies, um, and increasingly even more countries that are developing but doing well, um, have really committed themselves to providing early childhood education, and they do so. And then a lot of developing countries still have big extended family um, uh, opportunities, so that uh, what you may not have in a formal setting you have in a village you have in a you know a, a group of homes even <clears throat> in uh, urban areas maybe two floors on a building where you know the family is there to do a lot of the child care and lots of times grandparents live in the family and all the rest of it 
So we're kind of in this <clears throat> unfortunate situation where we haven't committed to early childhood the way that I would like to see us commit. And we have small family units by and large, oftentimes separate from, by distance even, uh, their larger family. So we really put American parents in a difficult position uh, about how they're going to manage the you know, day-to-day -day practicalities of caring for uh, one or more children. Uh, J Jeffrey Canada, you know, you know look, we, we live in more siloed world uh, than we did before. We don't have the access to the village that uh, Secretary Clinton wrote about. Uh, how important is preschool then? I mean, is it something we should strive for to get every kid in preschool? Is that a good goal? Well, I, I think that uh, for lots of families, preschool is an absolute essential. You know, it would be great if your child wasn't in preschool, that they were with a really caring, loving adult who was spending hours and hours talking with them. and take, But that's not the way most child care happens in this country. Uh, mostly people try and put child care together, often with folks they don't even know. You don't know really what's going on with your child. People have kids looking at TV sets instead of interacting with them. We know that for lots of children, and the poorer the child, the more essential it is for them to actually have a really solid period of time where those brains are engaged. And that's what high quality preschool does. It engages those brains. It, it's fun. The kids find it exciting. Parents can relax knowing their child is being taken care of and in good hands and has actually had a productive day. I think that this ought to be a universal opportunity for all Americans to have preschool. Not all families will use it, but they all should have access to it. And unfortunately, that is not the case. And Cindy McCain, you're here as well. You've been traveling quite a bit around the world. You know, in some countries, it's as high as 98% participation in, in preschool. Mm -hmm. We're nowhere near that level here in the United States. Do, do you, I mean, what's your take on that? Do, do you think it would make a difference? In Italy, for example, they have the Montessori system, the Reggio Emilio system, systems like that that really encourage that early childhood development. Mm -hmm. Should we have those sorts of systems here that, is, that are more, more broad spread? Absolutely. I mean, from, from what I have seen, I work primarily in Africa, and what I, from what I have seen, although the, the formal schooling is somewhat lacking in most of the places that I am, the family structure is there. Even in the, in the areas where there's conflict, great conflict, you see tribesmen singing and telling stories and things that we should be doing as well. So here, it, it, there is some, some good that comes out of that, but uh, clearly it's lacking. I think it should be worldwide. I mean, it, preschool is so important. Secretary Clinton alluded to this a little bit earlier, uh, Jeffrey, the, the word gap. And I have some of the numbers sure. here because I was fascinated by this as well. Toddlers hear an average of 2,153 words an hour from their parents. In working class families, it's 1,251. And in poor families, 616. I mean, it's a huge difference, as you mentioned, 30 huge million. Gap. It's a huge gap. And, you know, one of the things we were trying to figure out uh, is why does that gap exist, right? Why aren't poor families talking. And so we started something we call Baby College. We were actually sitting with parents, trying to teach them about what we know about brain development. And you know what? No one's ever said it was important. Mm -hmm. A lot of our parents think, well, my kid's going to learn when I send them to school. And I don't have a great education, so I don't really have much to offer. And so they're waiting. And as long as the kid is fed and healthy and clean, they say, I'm doing a good job as a parent. The fact that you should be actually talking with that child. They can't see what's happening with those neurons. And we have found when we explain it in ways that our families understand how critical it is, that they actually are great teachers and they are the first teacher. And that silly singing thing that you do, like, I can't sing, I feel silly. <laughs> that, that actually is like taking your kid to college, right? <laughs> That's building that brain. Then parents suddenly say, really? Even if I can't sing? Say the kid, uh, they will find out. But the kid <laughs> doesn't know right now, right? Uh, that, that, that a lot of this, Sanjay, is that poor parents, no one has sat down and explained that this is the most important thing they could give their child, right? They're thinking, I'm doing all the important stuff and I'm exhausted, right? Now, the one thing we haven't talked about is how tiring it is, right? right? Uh, a lot of folks, 
the first thing I ask someone when they have a child is four months, you getting any sleep? And the answer mostly is no. It is exhausting. And parents who have no resources, they don't have grandparents, they don't have childcare, they are so tired that they want to get home and they want that kid to go to sleep, right? And just give me some hours of peace. Going back and saying, no, 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 look, I know this is time, but this is the most important thing. This hour, this hour and a half, you've got to do this. It's going to take your kid's brain to college. They start getting it, and they start putting out that it's hard, it's complicated, but they'll do it if someone helps them understand how important it is. Next time I sing to my daughters, I'm going to say it's like going to college. <laughs> but, but it's a really good point, and the, and the message does seem to, to get across. I mean, we've looked at some of the data, and people are hearing this message. Let me ask you, um, Cindy McCain, Arizona in particular, um, there, you have a lot of immigrants living there. Secretary Clinton alluded to this earlier. They don't speak English as a first language often. What, what are you seeing there? I mean, are, are people less likely to be reading to their children, to be speaking to their children, engaging that way? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, the answer is absolutely yes. They're they're for the reasons that were mentioned. They don't want to speak their first for their first language. Mostly in Arizona, it's Spanish. They don't want to speak it. They think they should be speaking English instead. Uh, they don't want to reveal to the school or to the neighborhood or to the community center that they don't know or, or they have questions or they're frightened. So what too small to fail has has is teaching and what we what we believe in is speak the language, sing the language, story tell the language. Talk to your baby. Talk to your baby. It doesn't matter what language it's in. It's so important. And when you see these mothers' eyes, when you give, you, you give them the knowledge that, yeah, it's okay to do that, it's just like a light bulb goes on. It's wonderful to watch it. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's enlightening and it's uplifting for the parents. I, I want to I ask you something as well, Jeffrey, uh, about something that you've talked about in the past, and, and I can't help but ask in the wake of what's happened with Adrian Peterson yeah. recently. Yeah disciplining your child, yep. corporal punishment. Yep. Um, first of all, I mean, it, it, there, there's no guidebook on, on any of this stuff, and it's obviously a provocative issue for, for a lot of people out there. What do, you, what do you tell the people that you're helping counsel? So one of the areas we cover in baby college has to do with discipline. And the most contentious issue we deal with is whether or not parents should use corporal punishment. Mm -hmm. And uh, you find a, a large set of beliefs around that's what's going to stop my child from ending up becoming a criminal or breaking the law. That, you know, they hear this spare the rod and spoil the child. All of this is so deeply ingrained in lots of cultures that it seems almost an anathema to say, no, you can discipline a child without corporal punishment. We, we failed at delivering this message because we test before and after and we kept trying to explain to parents what the difference was between discipline and abuse because there is a dis there's a there's a real difference right spanking can be done, I don't agree with it it can be done without abusing a child but a lot of our families grew up being abused they were beaten with articles and objects switches and sticks and hairbrushes leaving welts and marks so we tried to teach families that in our families weren't learning it and finally I went back and said to my staff hey guys do you believe in corporal punishment and they all did hmm. right so you can't teach what, what you don't believe right they didn't believe it so they couldn't teach the families so we had to start with the professionals right this is why now the research on this is very clear uh, and what we found was when we really took our time because we have different cultures. We have a, a group from uh, African cultures. We have some from South America, some from Latin America, that we had to, under, to put this in cultural terms so people understood. Because a lot of folks are saying, well, that's why those American kids are so messed up, right? Is their parents are too permissive and they don't beat them. So we took the time to explain, to have the debate with parents. You just can't say, don't do it. To have the debate with parents and say, look, there's another way that's more effective, the science is clear, that you can be more effective in getting what you want without using corporal punishment. Now, I'll say this on the professional athlete issue. There is no excuse for that abuse. There is none. I don't care what your parents did to you. Look, I, I was put in cars. There were no seat belts. No one cared about it. No one would do that today. We have learned better 
than to harm and injure children. And you teach kids violence when you're violent against them. So I don't, while I understand culturally a lot of us, and I certainly was punished corporally and a lot of people were, I think that's a poor excuse to say it was done to me so I'm doing it to my kid. Uh, you're making, you're not a person without means and supports and you don't have to do that to kids. So I, you know, while I understand how they might feel about it, it is absolutely wrong. And I think we should have zero tolerance around hurting children. I think that should be zero. I don't excuse it from poor families who have no resources, right? I tell them, if I see you injure your child, I will call the authorities. I'm going to do that. You may not do that, right? So we can't make allowances for folk uh, who actually have means and money. Uh, I just think it's a bad policy, and we should just clamp down on that. Because if you injure a child, you'll probably injure other people too, the, the women. The, so this is like in America, this is like enough with this hurting people. Let's just put an end to it. It's, it's a... <laughs> I mean, this has been, these have been some of the most interesting discussions, I must say, as a parent, and it has served as a wake-up call, I think, for a lot of people who may not have known, for good or for bad, that they were doing something that just wasn't acceptable at all and didn't work. The data shows it doesn't work. I want to pull in one of our audience members now, uh, Kenneth Shinazuka. He's a high school student here in New York City. He's already this remarkable inventor. He was inspired by his grandfather's health problems. He developed a sensor system to track patients with Alzheimer's. Again, just a high school student. Um, Kenneth was a finalist also in the Google Science Fair, and this week he's being honored as a Davidson Fellow. Davidson is sort of the school for geniuses. Um, Kenneth, uh, welcome here. I'm not sure where you are exactly, but uh, there you are. Uh, what got you on this path, and, and, and what, what's your question for our panel? Sure. So my parents are civil engineering professors and they've uh, nurtured my curiosity from a very young age. And at the dinner table, they often spoke very enthusiastically about their work. So just hearing about their innovative approaches to difficult problems was what really inspired me to be creative later on in life. And going to their offices, I often tinkered with their gadgets and really got to know about sensors. So reflecting back on my earlier childhood now, I realized that my parents were really my role models. And I think it's really important for kids from a young age to have people that they can look up to, role models. And I guess my question for the panel is, how can we better place role models into young kids' lives? Um, Cindy McCain, do you, do you want to tackle that? What do you, what do you think? I, I completely agree with him. I absolutely think it's important. I think mentors, role models, anything that we can do to inspire a young mind and inspire someone to do to make themselves better than what they are and better than their own self-interest is extraordinarily important and a gift for these kids. I mean, you've talked about this a little bit. Everything in terms of putting people into, uh, into the homes directly to evaluate kids, but also serving as, as mentors, role models. Right, right. Well, you know, I think that uh, Kenneth's point's a, a, a really good one, and he was obviously very lucky uh, that his role models were his parents, and they were there at dinner every night uh, inspiring and challenging him. Uh, and I think that you know, there are so many opportunities for other adults to support that in a child. Uh, and, you know, what the Harlem Children's Zone has done is, in effect, provide other role models. In addition to what you're going to um, have as part of a family, there are other people you can look to, the professional staff, other experiences that you uh, can have. And, you know, resilience, which is such a, an important uh, attribute uh, for people because no matter who you are, you're going to get knocked down, and really what matters is if you get up. And children need people who can help build that resilience. So it can be a teacher. It can be a coach. It can be uh, a pastor. It can be a neighborhood uh, um, you know, store owner. It can be all kinds of people. And, and I guess I would just underscore how you never know, to go back to my mother's example, you never know when an act of kindness mm -hmm. or attention to a child mm -hmm. uh, can turn you into a role model, yeah. um, can turn you into somebody with whom that child feels, uh, you know, validated. And that's so important for children, don't you think? I, I, I really think it's important. And, and Kenneth, the one, the one place I think that we don't think about role models is parents, right? <laughs> Middle class parents go to mommy and me. Right? And what happens? You have a lot of other parents with exactly the same issues you're dealing with. It's not personal, right? You realize all two-year-olds, right, say no. I'm not taking this personal. It's not some personal battle. I'm, and it makes you feel better, right? It makes you feel more competent. Poor parents get so isolated. 
they don't have the support so they don't have anybody to role model when the kid does this oh let me show you how you handle that situation right and then says oh okay I got it and extended families a lot of times you had those role models the grandparents are stopping honey don't 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 do that that way that's not how we do it with children when you don't have any of that and it's just you and that child often parents are inventing it and they just don't know what to do so I think having role models for parents and when you get parents who have cohorts of children all the same age, guess what? Children go through the same stuff, right? And then you realize, hey, you know what? That's actually normal what my child is doing. I shouldn't really be going off the deep end about this, right? And I think so we need role models for parents to step up and say, hey, let me show you with my two-year-old, this is how I handled that issue. That's a great point. And along those lines, I want to add one more important perspective uh, from the audience. Uh, Ann Weisberg, she's a senior vice president of the Families and Work Institute here in New York City. She helps to research trends that are shaping the workplace. And when we talk about stakeholders and baby success, you've got parents, you've got schools, you've got the kids, to Jeffrey's point. You've also got the business community. So I'm curious about the workplace adapting well to families' needs. Thank you. Uh, yes, absolutely. The, the workplace is a huge stakeholder in this issue for several basic demographic reasons. First of all, most children, and even 60% of children under the age of one, are living in households where all parents are working outside the home. Okay. And 63% of the workforce are parents. So, you know, this, there is no line between being a parent and being a worker. Everybody is doing both. We are a nation of working caregivers. And the uh, business community has a huge stake in that because what makes families successful makes business successful because it makes families successful. So it, it's a positive feedback loop. So uh, my question is, how do we encourage businesses to invest in making families stronger? You know, one of the things that we're doing in Too Small to Fail is partnering with communities. And uh, we've started in Tulsa and in Oakland, California. And in both areas, it's been really rewarding to see how invested business has become because they're now hearing what we're saying from coming from many different uh, angles. And our, one of our principal partners uh, in Oakland is the Bay Area uh, Business Council. And they had been looking at problems in education, problem in skills training, issues that are very clearly about their businesses. Where are they going to get the employees of the next uh, years? And, and when you have people aging out of the workforce, where are their uh, successors coming from? And they on their own, before we ever approached them, said, you know, this starts earlier than school. We can deal with school. We have to make sure that schools are being uh, successful with their kids. But this starts earlier. This starts in the families. So I do think that on the productivity uh, front, on you know, good business practices, uh, employee uh, success, which then translates into success for the business, more businesses are now seeing that. And I, I also believe that more businesses need to be supportive of a lot of these family uh, support uh, systems that we're talking about. California yeah. has paid sick leave. Yeah. They just passed an extension of that recently in the legislature. All the studies show it hasn't hurt competitiveness. It hasn't destroyed businesses. You don't have people fleeing for places that don't have paid sick leave. It has been incorporated into the way businesses operate, and it has actually created more loyalty um, by the people who are now given a little bit of flexibility and support uh, as they take care of either children or aging relatives. Well, I, I, can I just say this one? Because this is, this is such a big issue in America, because when you look at the unemployment numbers, the number of folk who are working multiple jobs, right, and who don't control their schedule. So I'm, I'm in my first grade classroom, and I notice three kids who are sleeping. Hmm. I'm like, the kids are sleeping. It's 10 o'clock in the morning in first grade. So I call in their parents, and guess what I find out? The parents don't get home till 9 o'clock at night. Now, what parent could put their child to bed without even seeing a child? So they want an hour with the kid. So they have this 6-year-old staying up till 10 and 10.30. I said, well, you can't have a 6-year-old staying up till 10, 10.30 and then expect them to be at school at 7 o'clock in the morning. They said, what am I supposed to do? Right. What are you supposed to do? Right? What, I mean, this is your child. You haven't seen the child all day. And you, the, the little bit of time you have is actually interfering with that child's education. I think when businesses begin to understand that so many of our moms 
have sole responsibility for child care. And we should, we should just ask the question, is there a way to rearrange this so this woman could spend time with her child? That's just a question. And I'm telling you, I don't think it's because businesses are heartless. I just don't think anyone's raised the issue. People haven't noticed this huge shift in the American economy and how it's hurting our families. And I think we need to call it out more so businesses begin to say, I think we can do some adjustments that won't hurt the bottom line, but will help families. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Uh, and let me just say it's been an honor uh, to, to be on the stage with all of you, Cindy McCain, Jeffrey Canada. Secretary Clinton, you've been working on these issues for 40 years. I hope we were able to honor some of your perspectives today as well. Unfortunately, uh, that's all the time we have for. Uh, each one of us here and everyone watching, you do have the power to influence someone else's life. It's something that I've learned today. I hope you have as well. Let's use that power wisely. It's going to wrap things up for SGMD. Time now though, to get you back into the CNN newsroom with Deb Farrick.